Welcome to Better Business Outcomes, where we discuss how good communication can transform and grow organizations with a series of global leaders who have set the standard for what great looks like. I'm Sarah Waddington from Wads Inc., and I've been working in public relations for more than 20 years. In this podcast, you'll hear from leaders and senior communicators about their leadership journey and how they create social impact. You'll also understand the areas you should be focusing on to build personal and organizational resilience, find out how public relations can unlock value for your business, and enjoy a great listen along the way. Well, today I have the pleasure of welcoming Tom Levitt, who's the author of The Company Citizen, and whose community interest company, Fair For You, has recently teamed up with Iceland to launch a zero interest loan scheme to help struggling families across the UK put food on the table. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. This podcast, Better Business Outcomes, it's all about good leadership. What for you makes a good leader and who do you look up to? A good leader is someone who it's easy to follow, I imagine, because a, a, a leader that doesn't have followers is not much uh, on the leader stakes. Back in my history, I was, for, for 13 years, I was a Labour MP. And for most of that time, Tony Blair was the Prime Minister. And frankly, we couldn't have had a better leader. He was popular, he was rational, he was reasonable, personally very approachable, and great to be on that team. But I also take a longer perspective, and someone who has very much guided my work, I suppose, over the last uh, 10 years or so, has been someone who I I then wrote a book about, Francis Perkins, uh, who was the Secretary of State for Labour uh, in the Roosevelt government of, of 32 to 45. Okay. She saw at first hand the problems of factory safety as early as the early years of the 20th century. She spent 20 years working in New York on factory safety issues, minimum wage, child labor, women's rights, uh, uh, and so on. And of course, when she came into government, she created the New Deal, although she got very little credit for it. Incredible. Uh, but, but the major changes that happened on all of those issues, some of which, like the American social security system, uh, are almost exactly the systems that, that she set up 90 years ago. Uh, but uh, she was an incredible woman with a fascinating personal life. And, and for me, she, she is very much an inspiration. Another hidden female face of history. There's so many. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, she was not only the first woman to, to sit in the American cabinet, but for nearly 30 years, she was the only woman. And she still holds the record for any cabinet member for the length of time they sat in the American cabinet. But then you can't do 13 years in cabinet these days. Well, not anymore. Well, what a trailblazer. Um, let's talk about Sector for Focus, which you founded 12 years ago. This focuses on using the tools of business to create public good. Now, that's something uh, that matters very much to me. I know it just to you. Talk to us a little bit about that. How does it work? Well, I was a member of parliament up until 2010. I'd, I'd spent my whole life believing that, that government potentially had all of the answers. And I was also a great believer and activist within the, the charity sector. And again, in parliament, I spent 10 years chairing the all-party group on, on charities and volunteering. Something happened, though, in 2008. The crash came. And I think government, and I've not been part of political here, but I think government lost its way. It, it stopped being ambitious. We had a decade of austerity. And the idea of government delivering good at scale was getting lost. Of course, charities were still there, and they, they do some tremendous work, but it's never really at scale. And it was increasingly apparent to me that, that business actually had the capacity for long-term thinking and investment in a way that charities didn't and and that government had opted out of. Not only that, but businesses were starting to see the business case for being responsible for for putting issues like sustainability high up the agenda. It wasn't very popular 15 years ago, but uh, nevertheless, it was starting. And today it's grown into a a massive movement. Huge movement. Yeah, definitely on vogue now. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. So I took the the view that capitalism, uh, although I'd sort of uh, said for years how opposed I was to it, actually, it's nothing more than a toolbox. You can build a company and you'd use those tools to maximize profit if you want, or you can build a company and produce public good. You're actually using the same tools from the same toolbox. 
but it's the purpose of the company that's completely different. And that, again, is another revolution that's been happening in the last 10 years. Let's go into that in a little bit more detail. How can then management teams make social impact, if that's what we want to term it, a feature of day-to-day company life? Is it by revisiting organisational purpose? That's a very interesting question because you make a, a huge assumption in there. That is that actually every company has a social and environmental impact. The question is, is it positive or is it negative? And the way we measure growth, the way we've traditionally measured success let's take GDP, for example, measures only a small number of criteria and doesn't take into uh, effect the true cost of the negative impacts that business and the economy has on the environment. So uh, profits help generate GDP, but they may also help to generate pollution and greenhouse gases and so on. And they are not factored into the equation. They were always ignored. They actually had a name for them, externalities, But they're not external, they're intrinsic. And only by taking those into account can you see what the true impact is. And only when you can see what the true positive and negative impact is can you start to skew the balance towards the positive and away from the negative. And uh, as I say, that, again, is much easier to do when you're looking at things on a longer term and not just looking for short-term gains. We we know know, if you want environmental change for the good, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, certainly more than just offsetting too. Oh, don't get me started on offsetting. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, that's one for another day. We could be here for the full 20 minutes. It's really interesting though, isn't it? Because actually you get people who, I mean, you're a a very early mover in this area, but we have uh, a lot of leader activists right now who have started to understand the impact that their own organisation is making. How do you think organisations can bring an activist approach to the work they do? and, And should it be a consideration for every brand? I think it should be a consideration for every brand. And yeah, I, I did some work a few years ago, generously paid for by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Wonderful organization. Absolutely. To look at how small and medium-sized businesses engage with their communities. And I'll just give you two of the findings of that research. One was, well, it's not corporate social responsibility because we're not corporates, so it doesn't apply to us. Don't start me uh, on that term. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. It should be banned. Well, did you know that the first ever article written to say that the concept of corporate social responsibility was outmoded and outdated and of very little use was written in 1974? Do you know, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. And again, one for another day. (laughs) Absolutely. The term was first used in in 1955. But those small companies, the small businesses, did engage with their community, but not strategically. They didn't decide to. It just was a natural thing for them to do. Organic. Yeah. Organic. You know, they sponsor the primary school's football shirts. Yes, there's a bit of advertising in it, but actually they do it because the people who work there have kids who go to that school, you know, and things like that. They want to see it thrive and flourish. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. They feel part of the community. And you don't actually, of course, in small businesses, have people whose responsibility it is to look after the sustainability agenda or, or even the employee engagement agenda. It's only when you get bigger and you get specialists in those fields uh, that that you can make the most of it. But you can only make the most of it if they know what they're doing and and if they're aware of that company's position in society and within the environment. Yeah, 100%. Let's talk about Fair For You. You've done so many interesting things throughout your career and we're only touching on a couple today. But in 2015, you co-founded another community interest company called Fair For You, which is backed by social investors. What was what was the reason for that? What prompted you? I'll be absolutely honest and say it wasn't my idea. Uh, there was a banker <laughs> uh, who'd been all her life in banking and, and she'd reached the conclusion that banks did not have the interests of people on low incomes to the fore. And, you know, it's not a difficult conclusion to reach, to be quite honest. And she wanted a new approach to credit that would trust people on low incomes more than the present system did. Because what the system as it was in those days, exemplified by a company called Bright House. Oh, yes. It exploited people. Sure. With Bright House, to buy a £250 washing machine, you paid £10 a week. Now, most families can afford £10 a week for that. But for three years, that's £1,500 for a £250 washing machine. Now, cut a long story short, when we set up Fair For You, that same washing machine would be £7 a week for one year. 
Right. So there's a saving, a saving of over a thousand pounds there, and yet we can still run a business on that basis. So the emphasis was on putting our customers in control. She felt, you know, she wanted to create a business to aim at uh, people on low incomes. People told her, if you do that as a private business, people won't take you seriously. They'll think you want to exploit them. But she said, I know nothing about charities. I know nothing about social enterprise. So this very nice person said, we'll go and see Tom. So the two of us got together and we used my contacts to get the, the structure right, the legal legalities of it right, and also to, to get those first tranche of charitable foundations who invested in us. Because we're a loan company and you can't be a loan company unless you've got money to loan. And we had to borrow that money in order to do that. So uh, we set it up and over the next five years, we, we didn't make a profit as you know, <laughs> most, a lot of companies don't in their first five years of, sure. uh, uh, of operation. But we're breaking even now and we will progress in the future. Um, this is why I, I don't, we are a CIC, we are a social enterprise, but I don't call us a not-for-profit organization. What we don't do is we don't take the profits out of the organization. We leave sure, them it's there. all reinvested back in. Precisely, precisely. So it's fascinating the work that you're doing. Um, you've most recently hit the headlines for your partnership with Iceland. Can you explain that latest scheme and, and what the response has been like? Because I think it's been it's been staggering, hasn't it? It has. I should say that we've done about forty thousand loans up until this summer. How many pieces of furniture or electrical goods have we repossessed? None. And of course, we have a, a, a default rate. We manage that. We're dealing with people who wouldn't be given credit under normal circumstances. Sure. Great that you've got social investors who are willing to take that risk. But that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's about the appetite for risk. And it's about how you manage that risk. And the way we manage it is by putting our customers in control, treating them well, and establishing a good relationship with them and not just seeing them as cash cows. But anyway. Do you know that humanization point is actually very crucial because often it can be quite dehumanizing for, for people who are in a tricky financial situation. I mean, we're seeing so many people go to food banks and that's hard and asking for help and finding the help in the right places is hard. So to go Absolutely. to somewhere where you can feel safe in that relationship is, is so crucial. Absolutely. And, and uh, that's why our customers give us 4.8 out of 5 on Trustpilot. Uh, we are Britain's most trusted financial institution at, at Fair For You. Anyway, about four years ago, some very kind person invited me to come and speak at a conference. <laughs> uh, oh, it was you, Sarah. <laughs> it was, it was. That was a great conference as well. And uh, I was very appreciative of you giving your time then too. But it wasn't just me. Uh, a guy called Richard Walker was there, the chief sure. executive of Iceland. And it was that day, that meeting, that led four years later to the launch of what we're calling the Iceland Food Club. And Richard was quoted in the press earlier this summer saying, are you worried about competition from the other low-cost supermarkets? He said, no, I'm, I'm worried about competition from food banks because uh, you know his customers are, are leaving Iceland to go to food banks. They're not leaving Iceland to go to uh, uh, other supermarkets. And he also told me that... that uh, when the summer holidays come along, every other supermarket, their takings go up. But because Iceland serves a, a lower income demographic, its takings go down because families have to make their money last for longer over the summer. So we trialed for the last few months a £75 loan scheme. And when we launched it formally nationwide in August, it's a, an interest-free loan scheme, which can be topped up up to six times a year. A person can never be more than £100 in debt, as it were. And we ask them to pay back at, at £10 a week. And if they can do that, then that's great. They can be topped up again. And I said a moment ago, we'd, had, we'd done 40,000 loans in five years. Well, in the first week of operation, we had 40,000 applications. It's staggering. It's absolutely, absolutely staggering. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic that you're out there... <laughs> The fact that it's needed in 2022 in the UK, which is supposed to be one of the richest countries in the world, is is beyond belief. But uh, we are where we are. And I'm hoping that um, this story will be inspirational for other businesses who are wondering how and what they can do at this point in time. Because I do think there is an issue with particularly the private sector also stepping in to help where perhaps the state has failed. My words, not yours. I'll Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Sure. It's interesting that much of your work has been responsive to the politics of the time. Throughout the last decade, you know, we've lived through austerity, the pandemic, and now we're experiencing a political and economic crisis. 
Is it deliberate? Where do you stand on the politics of today? Are we leaving people behind? And do you feel the imperative to, to do your work uh, because of that? It, it, it is thoroughly depressing, Sarah. Uh, and, and again, the nice thing about working with businesses is they are not bound by the direction of the government of the day. And they can make interesting, innovative and positive decisions and investments that will make life better for people. And contributions. Absolutely. And it's also quite obvious, particularly about the, the management of the economy recently, that, that business is not happy with the way government is going either, apart from a, a, a narrow niche within high finance, who just bet against failure. Uh, and that, again, is no way to run an economy. Anyway, rant over. <laughs> I think the Brexit decision was an absolute huge mistake. And, and Nobody knew what they were voting for because nobody was telling them what Brexit would look like because nobody knew what Brexit would look like. They sure as hell didn't think it was going to look like this, which is a, a mess, a complete mess. And, of course, saying goodbye to our largest market, we are crippling our economy uh, in that sense. Sure. And people like Boris Johnson have to take a, a, a huge responsibility for that. But the other thing he did as prime minister, which I believe was unforgivable, was just before the 2019 election, he systematically got rid of a couple of dozen of what I would regard as friends of mine <laughs> within the Tory party, people who had a, a lot of values in common, sure. uh, people who were what they call one nation Tories. I've never been a Tory, I never will be, but I could work with these people. They had values, they believed they had a responsibility. And there's this other strand of Toryism, which actually says uh, and I think probably Ronald Reagan summed it up when, when he said that government's job was to get out of the way. In other words, enablers. You, know, you get in government in order not to govern, <laughs> in order to reduce regulation and so on. Uh, even Adam Smith did not talk about you know the free and unfettered market when he was defining capitalism 250 years ago. He talked about the need for good regulation and so on, which is absolutely right. But just every day, yeah. you know, there, there are ministers announcing this program won't be pursued any longer. These regulations will be scrapped and nothing will take their place. It's irresponsible. So that, that brings me to my next question then. You'll be familiar with the Nolan principles, which apply to anyone who works as a public office holder. And they cover seven principles, which are helpful to anybody who wants to be a good leader, I'd say. And they are selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. As trust in our institutions and media continues to drop, do you think these are missing from public life today? Let me acquaint you with another bit of my history. The Nolan Principles were put together by a you know, very well-respected judge in the early 1990s. And from 1997 to 2003, I sat on the House of Commons uh, Standards and Privileges Committee, and we looked at standards in public life. And all of the big cases from uh, Neil Hamilton and Cash for Questions onwards were issues which I was involved in uh, and yeah, looking at. Uh, and, you know, people did have standards. And if a minister was accused of doing something wrong, they were gone the next day. That's right. Do you remember those days? Do you remember absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We even had a minister, for heaven's sake, saying she didn't think she was up to the job, so she stood down, which was ridiculous because <laughs> she was the best education secretary we have. But anyway, <laughs> that's gone. You know, we now have a prime minister who lied to Parliament. We had a home secretary who was accused of bullying but stayed in uh, – sorry, bullying case against her was found and she stayed in office. Those standards have just gone uh, out, of, out, of, out of government. I don't believe they've gone for the majority of parliamentarians. I don't believe – They've gone in public life generally. But we've just had people who just don't care about standards who've been running government for the last few years. It's frightening. It really is. Well, let's hope we see a resurgence of those values at the very top very soon. Now, sadly, Tom, we're out of time, which is a shame because I could talk to you all day. Yeah. I'm going to ask you very quickly to say um, what you think is the one thing that leads to better business outcomes. Don't look down here at the short term, the sh no, near horizon. Look up at the long term. And when you look at things in the long term, you see things quite literally in a different perspective. A very, very simple example would be, should we put solar panels on the top of on our factory roof? Well, if we need to repay it tomorrow, no, don't. 
But if you're going to look at the advantages over 20 years, it's, you know, it's an absolutely open and shut case. Yes, of course you do. No brainer. Uh, no brainer. Absolutely. Uh, so thinking longer term, which is what businesses traditionally have been able to do, governments having historically been you know, bound to some extent by uh, general elections is a, a very, very advantageous quality. I mean, let me give just one political example again. One of the proudest things I, I was in, involved with in government was bringing in the Sure Start scheme. Now, the Sure Start scheme, did it work? We don't know. It was, you know, it was going to take 20 years to tell us whether investing in the under fives to that extent was going to produce better citizens, better qualifications, higher skills in 20 years' time. But David Cameron removed most of it. We'll never know whether that was a good investment or not because the short term overrode the long term. Sure. And what a hole it left in society when, when that was pulled. Uh, I'm in the Absolutely. community around here that it was very, very much needed and uh, still yeah. the impact's being felt. Thanks, Tom. Well, that is the perfect wrap to today's Better Business Outcomes podcast. Long-term thinking is something we should all get better at, uh, including our political leadership. Huge thanks for giving up your time today and talking to us about how business doing good is just good business. Well, coming up later in the series, we'll be speaking to author of Technology is Not Neutral, Steph Hare. So don't forget to subscribe for free wherever you usually find your podcasts. And if you enjoy what you hear, please also leave us a review. See you next time.